and perhaps as a way to begin our conversation, which is going to be dealing with international law, power, and justice, uh, mm -hmm. let's perhaps begin with, uh, with the connection existing between international law and, and, and justice. Mm -hmm. Why do we have to believe that uh, uh, international law is at the same time an expression and, and a tool of, of justice at the international or uh, at the international or global level? Well, um, this is one of the most traditional ideas about law, that law is actually an expression of justice and a way of achieving justice. This is an, an idea of law that we have even in relation to domestic law. And uh, so this continues to be uh, one of the most important aspects of international law. Uh, but of course, um, as uh, some of your uh, uh, remarks suggest, uh, we can see international law in a number of different ways. So for some people, uh, international law is an expression not only of law, uh, of, uh, of justice, but it is also an expression in some ways of power as well. And so international law is this very complex, uh, you could say, um, uh, uh, set of uh, ideas, uh, set of doctrines, uh, which in various ways tries to incorporate and deal with all these different aspects of, uh, you could say, um, uh, law on one hand, justice, uh, power. And we can see this even in the way in which uh, the UN Charter is framed, because many of the, uh, you could say, very inspiring aspects of the UN Charter, which deal uh, with issues such as uh, trying to uh, end war and trying to achieve social progress and advance social welfare, you know, there's a very powerful language uh, the, that the purpose of the United Nations is to um, uh, end war, which has caused untold suffering. There's also the language about uh, advancing social welfare in larger freedom and so forth. And all this is very inspiring, and it could be seen as an expression of the UN's attempt to, you could say, advance the cause of justice. Uh, but then when we look more deeply at the UN Charter, we find that uh, the bodies within the UN Charter, which have the power to actually um, create binding decisions are bodies such as the Security Council. It is the Security Council which makes very important decisions about war and peace. And it's only the Security Council which has the power to make decisions that all other members have to comply with. And then we, when we look at the characteristics of the Security Council, we find that the most uh, powerful nations uh, whose positions are entrenched by law um, are the nations which uh, basically emerged victorious after the Second World War. So we can see even in the UN Charter all these different aspects of law, an expression of justice on one hand, an aspiration of justice, and also at the same time it is in many ways um, uh, embedded in a particular structure of power. And law itself reproduces that structure of power. Yes, I mean historically, so, I mean, yeah. at least in the West, we have been thinking that, uh, as, I, as I started uh, saying, you know, there is a strong mm. connection between international law and justice. In fact, part of your work mm. has been somehow to to deconstruct and criticize this, and, 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 and part of your work has been to highlight, in fact, mm. the very strong and, and mm. dubious connection existing between international law and power. Yes, yes. Um, and I have to say, it wasn't uh, unhappy, it was not a happy conclusion for me to arrive at. Uh, when I first started studying international law, when I decided on a career in international law, my idea of international law was very much uh, an idea of international law as a means of promoting justice. Yes. And so I was very inspired by uh, the writings of people on human rights. Uh, I was very inspired by my teacher, uh, Christopher Biramantri. Uh, but the more I worked in international law, and uh, the more I actually practiced international law and studied international law, the more I came to realize that uh, despite these great aspirations, um, there is this dimension of power. And this dimension of power often defeats the aspirations mm -hmm of international law to achieve justice. So I'm attempting in some way to try and reconstruct international law, to try and make it actually a vehicle of justice rather than uh, a vehicle of power. So, so, so tell us a bit about this journey. So you started as, as a mainstream international lawyer. You, you, you had this belief, and, uh, which is a you know, belief that most people interested in international law uh, start with. So you had this belief about you know, this connection existing between international law. And then suddenly you, 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 you felt that hmm, maybe it's not as simple as this. So how did it happen? What were the questions with which you started, which put you on this path? Uh, well, it was a particular experience, actually. Um, I was working for the government of Nauru, uh, which is a country that uh, not many people have heard of, but it is often cited uh, in international law textbooks as being one of the smallest countries in the world. It is something like five or seven square miles. And Nauru was placed under the care of Australia 
which was administering Nauru on behalf of the League of Nations. So this was uh, very much a story of international law trying to provide protection for the people of that country. And uh, what basically happened was that Australia mined out a substantial part of Nauru. And uh, once Nauru acquired independence, Nauru wanted to sue Australia uh, in order to gain some sort of compensation for the exploitation that had taken place and for the environmental damage that had taken place. So uh, I was involved in the process in a very junior role of actually preparing all the research materials that uh, looked into this question. And the remarkable thing I found was that it is extraordinarily difficult for countries that have been colonized and exploited to bring any type of claim in international law Why? for reparation. And so then the question uh, that emerged to me was, why is this the case? Because it seems that if international law is actually a means of achieving justice, then it should surely recognize uh, the various uh, atrocities and the various forms of exploitation which had taken place all around the world. But then I found that international law had this rather dual character. Uh, because on one hand, it seemed to promise uh, this sort of outcome uh, to provide compensation. But on the other hand, it wasn't possible to do so. Um, and in looking at the question of why it was so difficult for people who had been clearly uh, subject to terrible treatment and who had been exploited, uh, in looking at that question, I started looking at the, the whole question of the history of international law and the particular manner in which sovereignty had been constructed. So it was that experience which led me to think about the peculiar character of sovereignty. Because I, like many uh, eminent scholars um, uh, from the third world um, who have written very uh, important works, um, I found myself uh, thinking that international law is a means of reversing the effects of colonialism. And this was an idea that was very powerful, and it was an idea that was advocated by many of the most prominent scholars in the 1970s and, and the 1960s, from the 1960s onwards. But their great hopes for international law um, faded uh, over time. And all the attempts to reform the international uh, legal system in a manner that really benefited third world people uh, seem to have been uh, really, um, if not um, complete failures, at least uh, in many ways, uh, Certainly not great successes. So, so <laughs> hence, I think that the, the two questions which are the center of your work and work which you yeah. have been doing for more than 20 years now, first, uh, uh, how do we explain the fact that there is this uh, difficulty for international law to, to service yeah. issues of justice? So it's a, it's, a, it's a work which at the same time critical and historical. Yeah. And then second question, which I think is implicit but very much uh, 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 at the core of, of your work, how do we make sure that international law somehow does justice to justice in a way? There. So for the, first, uh, for the yeah. first part of your, I think, I mean, first of all, yeah. would you agree with such a characterization? Well, um, Sorry, can I? <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat the question? Well, <laughs> it seems to me that there are two issues which are really, yeah. you know, yeah. part of your work throughout the years. One is, yeah. you know, um, understanding why is yeah. international law yeah. not the tool you yeah. initially thought it yeah. was in terms of expressing yeah. and serving justice. Yeah. So it's about uh, having an history code and of yeah. international law. Yeah. And then the second question, which is actually a logical uh, yeah. uh, follow-up, is, OK, if international law, mainstream international law, is not really yeah. as, as useful as, as I thought when you were a young man yeah. uh, it was, as <laughs> it, it, or it should be, then how do we make international law more at the service of justice? Well, uh, very difficult questions. Uh, let me try and address them yes. one by one. Uh, the whole question about uh, what emerged from for me from this uh, uh, critical and historical approach, as you put it, uh, is to uh, think about uh, the way in which imperialism really had a profound impact on the whole character of international law. And that was not something that I had properly appreciated. And the reason I had not properly appreciated it was because conventionally, uh, the major texts of international law tell us that colonialism was a thing of the past. So certainly it is accepted by uh, international lawyers that international law was complicit in promoting colonialism. But the basic argument wa is that, yes, we, international law promoted colon colonialism, but when we came to the UN period, we find a time when international law promotes decolonization instead. Mm 
And as a result of this, we have the emergence of all these new states. And it is the United Nations that has to be thanked in many ways for promoting ideas of self-determination and so forth. So the conventional story about uh, uh, the relationship between imperialism and international law is that imperialism concluded yeah. with the whole process of decolonization. But my own research led me to think that nevertheless, imperialism has had such a fundamental impact upon the underlying structures of international law that it continues to exercise uh, a very powerful, if un unacknowledged, presence. Yeah. So, 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 good idea. so that was my, the basic argument I tried yeah. to make. Uh, and in that respect, I want to differ uh, from, you could say, the more traditional approaches to international law, which say that in imperialism was just peripheral to international law. Uh, so the classical idea about the history of international law is that international law was created in the West, and all the major developments took place in the West. And we focus on things such as the Peace of Westphalia as an example of the type of historical circumstances in which modern sovereignty came into existence. My argument, uh, by contrast, is that international law was created out of the encounter, out of the imperial confrontation between the, non -West. Between, between the West and the non-West. Mm -hmm. And it is that encounter which has structured the whole character of sovereignty. And so the conventional story says the non-Western world lacked sovereignty. And so it had to be provided. But my argument is that sovereignty is not only about extending out to the non-Western world. It is about excluding the non-Western world in the first place. In other words, before you can incorporate the non-Western world, first you have to exclude it. Mm -hmm. So within sovereignty doctrine, there are a number of mechanisms which would condemn certain people who have a different culture, a different political system, as being not sovereign. Yeah. And so it's that double movement that I was interested in. And my argument is that within international law, there continue, continue to be mechanisms by which this exclusion of certain peoples continues to take continue. place. So, so essentially, this connection that you see at the center of, uh, I mean, you, you said the center of international this connection between international law and imperialism mm -hmm. is pre-UN and in fact at work still in the UN world. Yes. So just to be more concrete, give us an example of, and clearly the notion mm -hmm. of sovereignty is, is centered to your sure. argument, mm -hmm. give us some concrete examples mm -hmm. taken out of history uh, illustrating this connection between international law and imperialism mm -hmm. in the pre-UN world, if you will. Certainly. Um, well, in the pre-UN world, um, under the international law that existed in the 19th century. And of course, this was the international law that was authored by the West, all the great figures of the 19th century, uh, for example. Uh, during that period, it was completely legal under the, inter under the international law as it existed at that time to actually conquer other peoples. Uh, it was uh, completely legal to go to war. So conquest and war were legitimated by international law. And uh, dispossession of people uh, was completely legal. Uh, in Africa, elsewhere, and so on. Yeah. In, a, in Africa, in the Pacific, in Asia, and so forth. Uh, but there's an even, you could say, uh, an even older history. We can go back to the 16th century and the works of uh, uh, Spanish uh, scholars such as Francisco Vitoria, who dealt with the whole question of how did the Spanish acquire title over the Indians in the New World, as it was called. Um, and there it's very interesting to see how those scholars try to justify Spanish title over the Indians. So the argument that Vittoria makes is something like, under natural law, it is permissible for anybody to enter into the territory of any other society in order to trade. If that entrance is opposed unreasonably, then this is a violation of natural law, because natural law provides this right of trade. So if natural law is violated by native peoples resisting these Europeans coming into their territory, then that gives rise to a violation which can then legally result in recourse to war in order to address this violation. So in all these different ways, um, European intervention and um, uh, invasion and dispossession was legitimized by international law during this period. We have people like Vattel uh, saying or arguing very powerfully that if people do not 
cultivate their lands, then they have no right to those lands. So uh, nomadic people or people who have a, a different idea of society and economy are seen as not having a proper legal personality. Their lands can be taken away from them. Why was it necessary during this pre-UN world for, for legal scholars to, to somehow argue about this? Because one would think that maybe since in a way they were stealing this land, yeah. there was uh, no need to go through this charade. Sure. Why was, why the need, it's you know, you call it a charade in a way, a yeah. legal charade. Yes. Yes. So why the need for this legal charade? It's a very good question. Uh, all these are very good questions. Um, and I would say in response uh, to that, that power never presents itself as just being power, or rarely presents itself as just being power. You know, there's Thucydides who says, uh, the strong dictate and the weak comply. But very often, power needs to tell a more, you could say, uh, benevolent story about itself. And so, in these circumstances where these same entities are claiming to further the cause of justice and to be act to be acting within the law, it becomes important for them, if they are to maintain their legitimacy, mm -hmm. to have some sort of legal explanation for yes. their actions. And so this is one of the things I find uh, fascinating about the history of international law, the way in which um, power has to be presented in legal terms. And many of the great international lawyers actually sought to become advisors to mm -hmm. governments. Basically, you know, basically sort of saying, uh, well, we'll be happy to try and provide you with an argument that will justify yeah, yeah, what you're doing. Yeah, in a sense, what I'm asking <laughs> you, who, who was the legal, who was the audience of this legal charade? I mean, you know, uh, was it these people uh, sure. from whom were stealing the land? Uh, was it, you know, European competitors? Because, I mean, yes, the legal exactly. argument has to do with, you mm. know, let's make sure that uh, uh, as, as a British power, we, we are justified to do what we're doing vis-a-vis -vis mm. our Spanish, Spanish competitors, Dutch sure. competitors, French competitors. So mm. who was the, the, the audience or, you know, uh, uh, that's very, uh, again, a very interesting question. And certainly, you're quite right in saying the audience was also uh, consisted, at least in part, of European rivals. Uh, so when we um, uh, read about uh, Columbus's own account of how he found this new world and planted the flag, in fact, it's a very powerful passage. It's, it's a short passage, and I'm tempted to read it out. Um, not only was he uh, signaling to the king of Spain that he had taken possession properly uh, of this particular territory on behalf of his majesty. He was also s signaling to other rivals that at least within the law that uh, was understood to exist among different European powers, that he, Columbus, had gone through the necessary steps to protect his claims the Spanish claims as against the rivals. Mm -hmm. or the, and so during forth. this period, I mean, do you know of any dialogue which would have taken place between European lawyers and non-European lawyers and, and claims and counterclaims? I mean, you know, in essence, the, the people from the non-Western world, yes. were, were they heard in any way? Um, I'm tempted to read this, uh, uh, this passage by Columbus. <laughs> which the book is, is here. here, yes. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> because I see this really as being uh, central to the whole question of when international law uh, arises. Um, and uh, here uh, we see Columbus uh, saying, if I'll just read it. Yes, please. Um, I don't do a very good Columbus, but let me try it. <laughs> Let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, as I know, you will be pleased at the great victory with which our Lord has crowned my voyage. I write this to you, from which you will learn how in 33 days I passed from the Canary Islands to the Indies with the fleet which the most illustrious king and queen, our sovereigns, gave to me. And there I found many islands filled with people innumerable, and of them all I have taken possession for their highnesses, by proclamation made and with royal standard unfurled, and no opposition was offered to me. So it's a very interesting moment because we see law entering into this picture in the second sentence. The first sentence is you know, paying uh, due homage to his majesty and all the rest of it. And then he arrives in this place. He doesn't know where he is. He thinks he's in the Indies. He sees people. He doesn't know how many. And the first thing he does is he takes possession of them. Mm -hmm. And in order to give that possession a legal character, he has to read a proclamation. 
and he has to unfurl the flag. And it's very interesting how here he seems to be suggesting that he gave the Indians an opportunity to speak, isn't it? He mm -hmm. says, and no opposition was offered to me. So in other words... So were, they, they were given a chance? They were given a chance. So in other words, he goes through the motions in, just in that one passage of appearing to give them the opportunity to speak and at the same time speaking for them. So uh, this, was, uh, this is, I would say, very typical in many ways about the way in which that relationship emerged. Now, in the case of um, relationships between Euro Re European powers and Asian states in the 16th and 17th century, the whole process was much more complicated because in many of those countries uh, there were uh, established political entities and, it was and there had to be negotiations and there were treaties that were entered into. So it was much more difficult to, to, to disregard altogether the, the legitimacy of the polities with which they were dealing. Yes, uh, because uh, of the, you could say, um, because the power differentials were not quite so significant. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the case of the New World, um, as uh, uh, we would call it, uh, the power differentials were such that Columbus could proclaim, and there wasn't anyone to contest it in an effective manner. Mm -hmm. In the case of uh, the Dutch East India Company going to uh, Asia, uh, it was a, a more complex process. Actually, I shouldn't use the word more complex. It was a somewhat different process uh, because there they encountered uh, established in a manner that they would recognize themselves as being established kingdoms and so forth. But was the end result uh, that different? The interesting point is that in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, at least in Asia, initially the relationship was a relationship much more of equality. Because we can imagine the situation of the Dutch East India Company. It was dealing with, uh, you could say, kingdoms that were, had armies, uh, that could protect themselves and so forth. So it was a gradual process that took place in those circumstances. And there were many treaties entered into by the Dutch East India Company, by the English East India Company and so forth. Uh, so it was a somewhat different process. Mm -hmm. But then when we come to the 19th century, we find a situation in which European power is really paramount. Um, it is uh, superior in so many different ways. and. In those circumstances, then we find a situation where the 19th century scholars say, we have the right to go to war against these peoples, and that is something that we can decide among ourselves. In other words, it doesn't even seem necessary for that other party to actually violate yeah. international law in any way. Was it the case for, for, uh, for, for Africa? Um, so in Africa as well, uh, it's a complicated story, because in Africa, even in the 19th century and in the 18th century, there were many treaties that had been entered into between and African yet, powers. There was hardly any parity of power between the Europeans and the African societies. Uh, in the so why such treaties? Right. In the initial stages, uh, we can imagine the situation that these were trading companies. They didn't have entire armies supporting them at that stage. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if we look at uh, how um, Stanley, uh, Henry Morton Stanley, uh, explored and took over various parts of uh, Africa, he basically had a simple treaty drawn up. And you can understand the situation. He's very far away from any kind of supporting army. He's dealing with these African chiefs. And so in those circumstances, he had a box full of these treaties. And of course, it's un completely unclear as to whether the African chieftains understood at all what they were signing. Because if you read those treaties, uh, they're quite extraordinary in terms of these African chieftains apparently saying, you know, we hereby grant to you forever yeah. all the resources of our people and we place our people within your protection. Yeah. And this becomes the basis then of a scramble for Africa. And then we need the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885 for the different European powers to try and work out a system of establishing title over African territories. And then we have the whole tragedy of the Congo and yeah, King Leopold yeah, and absolutely. so forth. Absolutely. In this taking over, in this legal yeah. taking over mm. of the non-West by the West, I mean, do we see uh, differences in the European legal traditions? For instance, the, the, the Spanish, the British, the French, the Dutch, uh, the Portuguese, I mean, yeah. uh, their, their legal approach to uh, the taking over of uh, these territories in, in Southeast Asia, in, in the Americas and so on, 
uh, do we have differences and do we have significant differences? Yes. Uh, and, and what are the reasons of the of the? Uh, uh, yes, uh, there are differences, and uh, in fact, it's interesting how colonial rivals condemned uh, each other in various ways. Uh, so, in the case of the Spanish, uh, their jurisprudence is driven very much by, you could say, a Catholic understanding of international law, because the jurists of the time were also priests, and so uh, there's a very complex relationship between theology and international law at this point of time. And there's a complex process whereby uh, the Spanish jurists try to work out the relationship between, you could say, the King of Spain and the Pope. What is the authority of the Pope in these types of circumstances? So their jurisprudence is inflected and influenced in very significant ways by these, you could say, overarching religious considerations. Um, and a certain idea of religion and natural law in a very complicated relationship. So that's in the 16th century, where natural law based on religion uh, applies. By the time we come to, for example, the 18th century and someone like Mattel, there's no religion uh, that is a part in a, any explicit way of his jurisprudence. Mm. So this is the Enlightenment. And so he, he looks at the issue much more in terms of something like political economy, mm -hmm. the natural law of political economy, if you want to uh, call it that. And it is in those circumstances that his idea is based very much on the concept of commerce and the idea of productivity. So societies that are not productive, which do not utilize their soil in an efficient manner, are not as legitimate. Are not legitimate. And therefore, should yes, be so treated accordingly. Exactly. Mm. Hmm. And so that's the basis on which uh, countries like Australia are settled uh, or conquered, as uh, the case may be, because after all, you know, the Aboriginal people lived in Australia for a long time, 40,000 years. And it's quite <laughs> ironic because at the time in the 18th century, the ideology having to do with interest, self-interest and commerce mm. was meant to be a peaceful one. Exactly. And here you go, exactly. used as a way to take over territories and, and to conduct war. Exactly. Um, and uh, in the 18th century, we find people like Kant saying uh, in various ways that commerce is a way of avoiding war because commerce is a circumstance in which we all benefit. You know, it is exchange, it is contract. And nevertheless, if we look at the history of international law, we could see commerce as being actually the basis on which wars are fought. And so going back to Victoria, we have a circumstance in which Victoria basically argues if these people are not willing to engage in commerce, mm -hmm. then there is a reason to say that they are violating natural law. Mm -hmm. And then we can engage in war. Before we go to this connection between international law and imperialism in the UN world, yes. uh, mm -hmm. maybe a few words on mm -hmm. the 20s and the 30s. Yes. Because mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. that it's an important period. It is a very important period, and I feel that uh, we haven't really appreciated how important it is. On this specific point? On this specific issue. So tell us a bit about it. Well, um, the League of Nations is a fascinating period, and I really feel that uh, it's only in more recent times that we are doing justice through historical scholarship to what a complex uh, time this was, and what the major achievements of the League of Nations period were. I think. The League of Nations has often been dismissed because it was unable to prevent the Second World War. And so it is seen as a massive failure. And many of the institutions linked to the League of Nations period are also seen as failures. You know, we have the Permanent Court of International Justice, and that doesn't work in the manner it was uh, hoped it would work. And so it is seen as a period of huge ambition, but massive failure. But what I found interesting is that during the League of Nations period, if we have a look at the whole question of that period, not in terms of European concerns, but in terms of imperial concerns, then many important developments take place. Uh, so the, during the period of the League of Nations, we have the creation of uh, the mandate system of the League of Nations. And this is a really, in many ways, a novel idea. The basic idea of the League of Nations was to prevent colonial exploitation that had occurred in the 19th century. And President Wilson of the United States was especially um, articulate and insistent upon this issue. And Wilson's idea was that states could govern other people, but they would govern those people as trustees. Mm 
And so this exactly is how Australia comes to control Nauru. So under the League of Nations, Australia is not the colonial authority over Nauru. Australia is rather acting on behalf of the League of Nations, administering Nauru for the benefit of the people of Nauru. Like a father figure. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And so actually that helped our case immensely <laughs> because we could say there is actually an international legal instrument, a treaty, which Australia has signed, and not only Australia, but England and New Zealand. And it is a violation of this treaty to have exploited the people rather than looked after their interests. So we find with the League of Nations period the first beginnings, in a way, of the idea that these colonial entities might become independent self-governing entities. And we find in the language of Article 22 of the mandate of the League of Nations a mention of the possibility that many of these entities will become self-governing. And these, as we know now, continue to be some of the most complex territories in the world because we find the mandate system applicable to Palestine. Yes. Uh, these were the A mandates. Then we have the B mandates in Africa. And Rwanda, for example, was a B mandate. So Belgium administered Rwanda under the auspices of the League of Nations. And the irony is that in administering Rwanda, apparently for the interests of the people of Rwanda, Belgium basically created a number of complications which continue which, on yes. today by making all these ethnic distinctions yeah. and creating different races uh, at a time when it seems the people themselves did not understand themselves in the terms that the Belgians actually yeah. Presented to them, <laughs> which brings us to, to 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 part of your argument. That is to say that even in the in the UN world, yes. this uh, this uh, connection which you identify in the context of uh, the pre UN world regarding international law and imperialism mm -hmm. continues to have relevance. So, give us some example about this continued connection between international law and imperialism in 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 the post 1945 era. Certainly. Another reason why the mandate system in the League of Nations is, in my opinion, very important is because even though the entities that were placed under, under the mandate system became sovereign, what we can see simultaneously is a situation in which the acquisition of political sovereignty is simultaneous with the loss of any real economic independence. In other words, this is a period in which we can see how international institutions and doctrines of international law can create a situation where states might become officially sovereign, but at the same time they are brought into the international system in a manner that ensures that their economic interests are outside their control. So from the beginning of uh, this whole process. I mean, colonialism was driven by, you could say, economic interests. And the basic idea, which has been repeated consistently through many centuries, is that colonies are important to the West, to Europe, um, for several reasons, having to do with colonies providing markets on one hand and providing raw materials on the other. So in other words, there is um, a particular system of international economic law that is based on this particular premise. And of course, within that system of international economy, the developing country or the colony is always in a subordinate, subordinate position. Now, I would argue that many of the institutions created actually just before the United Nations, institutions such, a, such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and in a more complicated way, the World Trade Organization, in many ways, these institutions continue to maintain that same hierarchy. And so we see, uh, uh, in the case of the IMF, uh, an institution that is uh, driven very much by its major shareholders, um, and which is articulating a particular idea and a particular, particular model of political economy, which in the view of many economists, both from the West and the developing countries, will ensure that these people or these countries will remain in a position of economic subordination. Mm -hmm. 
But, but this is more in the field of uh, international economics. Sure. So, yeah. but uh, does your argument also apply to uh, organizations which are dealing with the matters of peace and, 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 and war? I mean, the UN. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, the case has been made often uh, when it comes to biases of, of the World Bank and the IMF, yeah. and you have written extensively on the matter. Yes. Uh, what about uh, whether or not these biases exist uh, uh, in the context of the UN? in terms of legal categories as applied to humanitarian interventions, as applied to human rights, as applied to matters of one peace and so on and so on? Well, um, you know, it's a, uh, a continuous argument. Uh, well, we can address that in a couple of different ways. Um, one way in which uh, we might address this is to think of the whole question of uh, the very important issue of state building. Now, this is an issue that has preoccupied the United Nations a great deal. And it has resulted in you know, very many volumes being written, written about the whole question of international territorial administration. In fact, you've written. A little bit, yes. Uh, and uh, edited, uh, edited a wonderful volume on this, mm -hmm. uh, Jean-Marc. Um, so there, too, we have something like the mandate system, I would argue. Mm -hmm. In other words, the purpose of the mandate system was to recreate the colony in the supposed image of the West saying we have an authoritative idea about what is best for these people. Similar ideas seem to be very important in the case of nation building. And in the case of nation building, the United Nations gets involved, but so too do many of these development organizations. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. And so then it becomes a complex process in which all these institutions are involved, and that could result in a similar type of political economy being created. Mm -hmm. And if that unequal system of political economy is created, then it also distorts all sorts of other doctrines which have a great deal of potential, such as human rights. Yes. Um, so you know, I, uh, you know, human rights was uh, what inspired me to first uh, uh, study international law. But uh, what disturbs me is the way in which uh, human rights, precisely because it is such an important and universal discourse uh, can be appropriated by different actors. And so it's very interesting to see the way in which uh, some of these financial institutions and development organizations have been appropriating the language of human rights. And so in those ways, human rights itself becomes a mechanism by which uh, these systems of uh, hierarchy are uh, reproduced. And, and so, uh, so it leads, it leads me to my, se to, my, to my next question. So what is the way out? Because I mean, and, and we refer to the second part of your work, because uh, I think a, a huge part of your work so far has been uh, about telling the story yes. of this connection between international law and, and power not at the service of justice. And, and so you have been one of the uh, leaders in terms of uh, uh, critical um, understanding, explanation of international law. But of course, all this leads to, okay, what you know, what's ne what, what is next, what do? And, and what do we do about this, both in the field of uh, international law as, a, as, a, as, a, as an academic field, but also in the field of practice. Yeah. And I think that you're also trying, uh, beyond criticism, beyond, sure. critical, beyond the critical approach, you're trying to look for ways yeah. to try to put forward, to put on the, on the intellectual and policy table, if you yeah. will, alternatives. Sure. So intellectually, how do we go about this? Yeah. And practically or politically, how do we go about it? Large questions, and I don't feel I've uh, got uh, any easy answers to them. Um, I think the first step actually is a step of recognition that international law can not only be this uh, redeeming, liberating vehicle of justice, but there is also this dark side of international law. I think that's an important step. Um, and I found it interesting uh, that I've received emails <laughs> from people uh, who've come across my work, who work in development uh, studies, for example, who say, I didn't realize that actually there is this dimension of um, international law. And this has helped me rethink what it is I am doing as working for this particular development agency. And um, many of my colleagues, I should say that I belong to a particular group of scholars. We call ourselves third world approaches to international law. Uh, we've been working in different ways on these issues. Um, so one of my colleagues, uh, Balakrishnan Rajagopal, is dealing with the whole question of social movements. In other words, how do we empower people in an effective Who way? Who teaches at MIT, I believe. Who teaches at MIT. Uh, 
um, uh, another colleague of mine, Professor B.S. Chimney uh, at uh, Java Nehru University, has been looking very carefully at this, these questions of political economy. And so what can be said is that in the 1970s, a whole series of very ambitious proposals were made by the new states in an initiative called the New International Economic Order to actually reform international law. But for various complicated reasons, because of the colonial history of international law, those efforts were a failure. So enormous efforts have been made. Numerous proposals have been made. The United Nations itself has been the vehicle of these reform attempts. And so because the developing countries had whatever they, power they possessed, in the form of the numbers they enjoyed in the General Assembly. We have numerous General Assembly resolutions which actually try to present an alternative vision of international so, law. So in essence, you're telling us that uh, in practical terms, international law at the UN and so on hasn't changed, but has it changed in the field of scholarship? I, I mean, you I, know... Yes. Uh, 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 sure. Um, well, perhaps it has changed, in, in, even in the United Nations. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in the field of uh, scholarship, um, I do think now, uh, I'd like to think we have a better understanding about the difficulties, difficulties that we confront. Mm -hmm. Even when we uh, look at very practical issues, such as um, the particular legal structure of the World Bank and the IMF, you know, what is quite remarkable if we look at the constitutions, the articles of agreement of these institutions, is that a very powerful argument can be made that these institutions are not bound by international law, mm -hmm. by general international law. In other words, there might be developments in international environmental law, for example. But the World Bank is not legally bound in its own operations to actually comply with whatever the developments take place in international en environmental law. Uh, it's extraordinary uh, to see just how, uh, you could say, autonomous those entities are. And they are autonomous even of the United Nations. We, we, we used yeah. to have a, a field of international law applied to economics. Yeah. We used to have it, somehow it, it disappeared. Well, it's, I would say it's been transformed into various complicated subfields. I think this is the other thing that has happened in international law, which is that uh, it has become so uh, specialized and it has spread everywhere. I would say there's almost no area of human activity that isn't in some way governed by international law. That's an ambitious claim to make, but uh, even things like family law, now there are treaties dealing with family law, precisely because of the whole question of globalization. But, but do we have convergence and coherence when it comes to these uh, various legal regimes? Because for me, what uh, I'm not really an international lawyer, but what strikes me is that you know, very often you know, someone who's a specialist uh, in, in the field of human rights regime yes. you know, knows very little about uh, regimes having to do with the environment and, the develop and development and so on, while these things are connected. So first of all, you have a, a, a specialization mm -hmm. existing when it yeah. comes to uh, legal regimes, mm -hmm. and then you know, do these uh, legal regimes adapt to something which is uh, coherent and convergent? Well, uh, again, uh, uh, a very interesting and hard issue. And many scholars have talked about the fragmentation of international law. Uh, the WTO is one regime, uh, and uh, you know, the international financial institutions have their own uh, set of operations and their own rules. Um, and even while they have their own rules, inevitably they impinge upon various other fields of international law. And so the argument now is that, uh, in fact, international law is fragmenting in various ways. We have so many different tribunals which could decide um, somewhat similar facts in entirely different ways because they are bound by different laws. Um, and it does require a new type of scholarship in many ways. Although I must say, uh, in fairness, that what is remarkable about scholars like Grotius is that they really were extraordinarily learned. And if you read Grotius or Vattel, it's extraordinary to read their work because they cover every aspect of international law as it existed at that time, that point of time. But it was essentially Western uh, 
legal uh, scholarship. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and can we, and this is actually what I wanted to ask you too, because I mean, you know, you, you are as much uh, a lawyer, uh, a professor of law, as an historian of yes. international law. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what strikes me once again is that international, the history of international law has been so far essentially a Western history yes. of international yes. law. And uh, first of all, is it good enough today? And uh, should we think about somehow internationalizing international law, both yes. in practice, in theory, but also in history? Certainly. Um, and that's another project which has been undertaken uh, by a very eminent scholars such as uh, Professor R.P. Anand from India. I think he is one of the really pioneering scholars. Uh, a scholar who tried to say India has its own tradition of international law. It is a very ancient tradition of international law. There are treaties uh, that we can point to which existed you know, long before Europe actually uh, arrived in India. Uh, we have uh, scholars uh, such as uh, Christopher Virumantri who talks about the cultural traditions of Islamic societies and Hindu societies and Buddhist societies. And all these societies have a very you could say, uh, developed ideas about um, political institutions, uh, about the whole question of war, uh, for example. So Judge Viramantri cites uh, you know, the Mahabharata in his decision in the nuclear weapons case. So there is a very rich body of learning that is available in many of these societies. And it's interesting that uh, scholars in the West uh, recognize this. Um, you know, I remember uh, Professor Milton Katz, who uh, taught at Harvard, uh, and was very heavily involved in the graduate program at Harvard, uh, one of his articles saying, we have a lot to learn from these other societies. But of course, it is the victor who writes the law. Yeah. <laughs> it is the victor who writes the history. But now I think we're in a very interesting moment because... Uh, there is there, a window of opportunity now. There's a window of opportunity because I think there is uh, clearly um, an indication that the power of the West is no longer as dominant as it used to be. And uh, we have, uh, let me uh, just mention, uh, a number of um, initiatives taken by various bodies. The Asian Society of International Law, which is going to meet in Beijing in August. May I interest you in coming? I would be interested. <laughs> so, I would be in Beijing, as a matter of fact. Wonderful. 27th yeah. and 28th of August. Uh, and these uh, societies are now trying to, at one level, reconstruct the jurisprudence of their own heritage, yes. their own tradition. At the same time, importantly enough, they are, we have a, a group of scholars who are completely expert in the Western tradition, but who are also conversant with these other traditions. So it is that type of communication uh, and exchange and engagement uh, that we need to engage, to be involved in, to try and create a universal, a universal international law. Universal in the sense that it is a system that takes into account all the different values and ideas of the, the whole global community. And for example, uh, there are various ideas about the relationship between man and the environment uh, that uh, can be found in various traditional societies, which I think are very relevant now. And that's why Judge Viramant recites those instances. And, and, and what are the chances for this uh, plurality of, of cultural and legal traditions to become part of, of the overall the global legal tradition, because I think that it is needed intellectually, but also in political terms. Yes. So w what are the and and, and you know what are the chances for this to happen, and, and what are the chances for the curriculum yes. and the research agenda in law school somehow to evolve? Certainly. Um, I don't. Well, uh, we can deal with these issues at a number of levels. We can see the attempts already being made by some of the most prominent third world judges of the International Court of Justice to try and introduce these ideas into the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice because once it is there in the jurisprudence of the ICJ, it serves a couple of different purposes. It actually says these ideas are, are available for our scrutiny. Because there is language uh, in the statute of the ICJ which says that all the civilizations of the world must be represented in the work of the court. Um, it is also very inspiring to people uh, to find that their own traditions are reflected in this overall Absolutely. body of law, because otherwise international law is seen as completely alien. Absolutely. And uh, so we almost have to ignore which our is, own which, history and experience. Which ends up become, <laughs> be, be, being counterproductive from a political point of view as well as from an intellectual point of view. Very much so. Uh, now the interesting thing to me uh, is with the emergence of Brazil and China and so forth, uh, 
uh, we find already that several countries are using human rights in a way that the West is not using human rights. Uh, so people talk about the jurisprudence of the South African courts in relation to economic and social rights, for example, because traditionally Western courts favor civil and political rights. So we can see the way in which a few different things are taking place. In other words, international law is being adapted in various ways in these non-European countries in a manner that would be useful for the jurisprudence of human rights, for example. So that's one thing that is happening. In other words, that there is Western international law, but it's being used in a different way. Mm -hmm. So that's very encouraging. The other uh, process is uh, precisely this process of taking those indigenous traditions and trying to make them a part of the international system. Now, I suspect that uh, in the case of very powerful countries like China, they do have a very ancient tradition of statecraft. They have a very powerful idea of what sovereignty is about. And those ideas are sh certainly going to shape their diplomacy. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, there has been a lot of attention given to doctrines such as the responsibility to protect. Um, and it's interesting to see how some of the African countries certainly um, support those positions. But there's also a very powerful tradition about sovereignty that I think cannot be uh, ignored, which exists in the developing countries, and for understandable reasons, because they've been denied their sovereignty, and this has led to their exploitation. And, and so, so you, are, you, you seem to be quite optimistic about the possibility of having uh, the, 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 the legal tradition welcoming this other, uh, I mean, the, the legal yes. scholarship welcoming this other uh, legal traditions. You, you seem to be quite optimistic, or, or do you feel that there is quite a bit of resistance? Um, I am, at this stage, optimistic. Uh, I think I find, uh, wh one thing I find very uh, helpful and inspiring is that, uh, you know, um, many of my Western, I don't like these, I'm using these labels, but I don't like them. <laughs> the idea of Western and non-Western and so forth, you know, these are, uh, just uh, somewhat simplistic labels, and, which I'm using uh, uh, you know, for purposes of convenience. But um, I'm encouraged by the fact that, uh, for example, I thought my book would be you know, really viciously attacked because it makes a fairly radical argument. Uh, but what encourages me is that uh, uh, many scholars and institutions in the West have found it to be of interest and have engaged with it. Um, and I find students, uh, you know, I've been teaching in, uh, in America for uh, many years. I also teach in many uh, developing countries. But my students in America, for example, uh, have been saying, well, we need to understand this. So it is that process of education uh, that I think is uh, helpful. Uh, and at that stage, uh, you know, just a few days ago, I had a, a conversation with a student who had been educated in Switzerland. And uh, she said, you know, until I read this work, I didn't really appreciate the extent to which my whole focus on international law had been completely Western. Absolutely. But now I need to take this on. And in other words, there's a sincerity on the part of these people to really try and appreciate all the complexities of international Actually, it, law. It, you know, personally, it took me, you know, it took for me to spend time in Asia, in yes. Japan and China, to realize how, in fact, the old UN is, is, is you know, uh, to some extent, a, a very Western organization, yes. essentially a, a dialogue between uh, the U.S. And, uh, and Europe. And of course, that's yes. not <laughs> good enough if we're going to be a true universal organization. Yes, uh, and that was very much the thinking even in the creation of the Asian Society of International Law. In other words, up to that point of time, the spectrum of debate had been you know, all the way between A and B, as yeah. it were, when there is the possibility of debating issues from A to Z. So the, 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 the old alphabet. Yes, <laughs> uh, all the countries, yes. rather than just U.S. and Europe. Yes. Uh, because it seemed that all scholarship was focused on this particular axis. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the developments uh, that are taking place, um, uh, I think, which gives me re reason for some sort of optimism. But I must say I'm also somewhat concerned about another possibility to look at things in a somewhat more pessimistic way. So if it can be argued that international law is about power, and that international law is a vehicle by which the powerful can advance their own interests, then there is an interesting question for me. And that is the question of once certain developing countries yes. become powerful, why would they want to change the system 
if it operates in their interest. Uh, but Anthony, this is indeed a very interesting question. You know, you're asking us, well, uh, what kind of guarantee do we have that uh, the newcomers are going to behave better than, you know, yes. the, the old powers? Yes, uh, to me this is an interesting question. I think the issue is unresolved at this point of time. And we can see how various international institutions are trying to incorporate the new powers into their logic and into their system, isn't it? I think there's another dimension about imperialism which I should mention, because the other issue that really concerns uh, my, myself and my Twail colleagues is not just the imperialism of the West towards the non-West, but an imperialism by the non-West towards other entities which are weaker in character. And there is also a whole phenomenon of what we might call internal colonialism. So if we look at the plight of indigenous people in many developing yeah. countries, we can find many of the aspects of, you could say, classical colonialism, by which I mean the civilizing mission. So the civilizing mission is a structure of ideas whereby certain people are condemned as being inferior or backward or savage or violent. And then because they are backward or savage or violent, then international law needs to develop a, a number of doctrines to actually make those savage people civilized mm -hmm. or may, make those backward people advanced. So the, the global rebalancing of the world is not at all a guarantee that things gonna, uh, are going to get better in terms of having power and justice aligned through international law or uh, right? Yes, uh, it is an opportunity, but there is no guarantee. And so that is now the question that really interests me a great deal mm -hmm. because we can take this story about imperialism further to say, well, now, certain developing countries have the sort of power that developing countries did not possess in the 1970s. In the 1970s, developing countries had an agenda, and a very ambitious agenda, in relation to uh, international economic order, in relation to issues of um, uh, war and peace, and so forth. But they were not in a position to implement that agenda because they didn't really have the power. Now we have some developing countries acquiring the power. And the interesting question is how they will actually exercise that power. Whether they will actually join in a system that is in many ways unequal and unjust, yeah. or whether it will take the opportunity, whether these countries will take the opportunity to articulate alternatives. So what would be the state of mind? What would be the mechanisms which would uh, allow us to go uh, in a better direction for the future and not simply have newcomers uh, acting like old, I mean, old, yes. I mean, uh, old powers and, and yes. as badly as old powers and so on? I mean, you know, once again, what would be the way to really... What are the mechanisms? Uh, yes, align yes. power and justice at the global level with perhaps the help of international law. Yes. Well... Uh, I think it all depends on we, where we are located. So I see my duty as a scholar uh, to actually write about these issues, to raise these issues, to appear here and uh, speak about these issues. And um, you, know, you have done your own part in a certain way in uh, being gracious enough to uh, invite me here and uh, to invite other scholars who are engaged with these issues. So at one level, we have to make those ideas available. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have to develop those ideas. We have, have a to, conversation. We have to have a conversation. We have M to make present it part of the positions. public discourse. Yes. The other aspect is a, a more complicated aspect. And, um, you know, what some, sometimes I find encouraging is that people who work in international institutions have um, said, we are interested in what you're doing. In other words, what, my, um, what TWAIL is doing. And so how they take the insights that scholars might be able to offer and utilize those insights in their own everyday lives as officials or as diplomats or as aid workers or as development specialists. Uh, that is, in a way, up to them. <laughs> and I can't know how these ideas might actually work in those ways. But you yes. know, you are doing so. So you, so each of us has a responsibility. Yes. So you, 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 you talked about your responsibility as a scholar. What about as a professor, as as someone who who, who teaches the next generation? Yes. I mean, uh, uh, sure. Uh, so it's a whole question of what should the curriculum be. Yes, absolutely. This is uh, uh, the set of ideas that we want to try and um, 
uh, advance or at least present. Um, well, I think uh, the group of scholars I mentioned, Twail, um, uh, um, we have regular, uh, you could say, conferences. Uh, and we've now produced quite a body of scholarship that is fairly wide ranging, dealing with issues, you know, so I adopt a historical approach. Uh, Professor Chimney deals with uh, questions of international economic law. Um, uh, Balakrishnan Rajagopal deals with uh, human rights. Uh, Vasuki Nesaya deals with uh, issues of actually uh, uh, transitional justice and um, state building. Um, James Gathy deals with questions of uh, uh, commerce and war. So there is now a substantial body of work available. And of course, there is an older body of work, which has been very important, the work done by people such as Professor Anand and so forth. So now uh, scholars who are interested in pursuing these ideas or, uh, or professors who are interested in pursuing those ideas have a range of materials available. And so when I teach international law, I teach it in two different ways. On one hand, I teach a course on the history of international law, which uh, deals very much with imperialism and international law. On the other hand, I teach what might be regarded as a completely standard course, using a completely standard textbook. But what I do is I present this perspective. In other words, I ask the question, well, uh, this is the decision of the court. Uh, in what way does it favor people in developing countries? Or in what way might it be said to affect people in developing countries. If we look at the sources of international law, for example, a classical issue that has to be taught, the question would be, how can people in developing countries use these mechanisms to change international law? I think it's very important uh, to actually point out that a standard course in international law can be taught in this way, raising all these issues. The important question is to raise the correct issues in relation to the all the cases and all the doctrines that are classically taught. Because the same case can be taught in very different ways. Yeah. The most traditional cases can be taught in terms of precisely the issue of you know, who does this empower, who wins and who loses. Why is it that certain people cannot articulate their position and achieve a legal remedy? So I think that is the really crucial question. How can international law be used to empower the most disadvantaged people? That's a large question. Um, for uh, uh, people uh, uh, and um, you know uh, people working uh, in Twail, you know, try to ask this question, and we also ask the question of you know the whole problem of people in developing countries and the most disadvantaged people in developing countries, because on one hand, they need protection against imperialism. On the other hand, they need protection against the post-colonial state itself. Absolutely, yeah. Because and, and tensions within the state itself. And t tensions within the state itself, because there is. Because there are I mean, very often, <laughs> uh, uh, local elites uh, from developing exactly. countries are in a, in a situation in a relationship of alliance exactly. with <laughs> elites from the developed countries. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and I know Professor Chimney has written wonderfully about this. And you know, it's very interesting how elites in developing countries use the language of nationalism to condemn Absolutely. Western imperialism, mm -hmm. while while using many of the techniques of Western imperialism and many of the institutions to of Western imperialism to, power at home. to consolidate their own power and to suppress their own people. Yeah. And so that's why I find um, you know, the Middle East very interesting at the moment, because I see that as the second wave of self-determination. The s first wave of self-determination was to rid those countries of colonial masters. Mm -hmm. The second so that, wave so was, was government self-determination, and now you are seeing it as people, people self-determination. Self in relation to their own, own rulers. Yes. Self-determination where they as individuals and as communities are empowered to control their own lives. Mm -hmm. So that is why I think it's a very complex issue about how to find this middle road <laughs> between these two threats to the well-being of people in developing countries. Uh, because. Um, there are so many different ways in which their situation is undermined. And the other issue you raised is also a very interesting question. You know, I've been talking about the East and the West as though these are clear categories, and of course they are not. Um, I've been talking about you know, sort of Western imperialism, but imperialism has existed throughout history. <laughs> it so happened that... And it's not the monopoly of the West, not, in fact. not at all the monopoly of the West. And so that is my other concern, that this, these imperial categories are part of all societies.
there's some complicated relationship between sovereignty and imperialism. In other words, it seems to me that sovereignty has a tendency to expand. But in order to justify its expansion, it needs to tell a story. And the civilizing mission is a story that historically has been used for centuries. Yeah, and, 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 and in a way, the, 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 the generic question is, how do we make sure that justice or demands yeah. for justice are not the captive of power? And how do we make sure that power puts itself or is put at the service of justice? Yeah. That's the key question, both at the national level and, and at the international, international level. level. Yes, and I also think what we need to do is to understand the relationship between so-called international law and so-called domestic law. Because if we want to understand the way in which multinational corporations work, it's no good just looking at international law. It's a complex matrix of regulation, which involves international law, transnational law, uh, domestic law, uh, guidelines, and so forth. Uh, you know, it's another way in which we can see the continuity of, you could say, uh, the imperial past. You know, it's fascinating to note that here we are in New York. Uh, and this coast was explored by Henry Hudson in 1609. And he was exploring this coast uh, as an employee of the Dutch East India Company. And it was at the same time in 1609 that Grotius was writing some of his great works, dealing with the Dutch East India Company in its operations in the Indian Ocean. And Grotius was a spokesman for a corporation. He constructed an international law for a corporation. Mm -hmm. He was a very powerful influence on the way in which that corporation um, operated. And in those circumstances, his argument was... So he was a corporate lawyer? He was a corporate lawyer. <laughs> he was many things. Yes. <laughs> and it's extraordinary to see the power that corporations still, uh, you could say, exercise. So the other thing we need to understand is the, way, the question of who are the actors in the international system? How do they acquire power? And how is this power in many ways furthered through international law? For example, if we take the TRIPS, which is now an integral part of the WTO. TRIPS stands for? Uh, Trade Related Intellectual Property Standards. Mm. So uh, it has to do with uh, intellectual property uh, regimes. And it was a set of corporations that wanted these rules to be inserted into the WTO treaty. So there's still this very interesting question of the relationship between corporations and international power. And I don't want to say that all corporations are bad because that's far too simplistic. And many developing countries rely on corporations uh, to be socially oriented and everybody can benefit. Yeah. But these are some of the issues that are raised. The other interesting issue that I think really needs to be addressed is the whole question of cutting through the, these dichotomies. And maybe now it's not so much a question of, you know, East versus West. It's a question of rich people versus poor people. Because as you pointed out, the elites of developing countries have a great deal in common with the elites in the West. And so if we see it in those terms, then another set of issues arises. Mm -hmm. um, and then it becomes quite complicated uh, in a different way. So there are all these different ways in which power exercises itself. So we shouldn't be really uh, focusing exclusively on this uh, divide, uh, West, non-West, no. because it's not enough to really capture uh, what is at stake in, uh, uh, in international if law, are, the involution. Yeah, if our purpose is to uh, you know, seek international justice. Yes. Um, and it's very interesting to see what's happening here in the United States now, because in some ways it resembles uh, what happens with structural adjustment policies that the IMF prescribes? Yes. You know, we have a situation where schools are being closed down, where welfare is being cut. Um, and uh, this is an uh, experience that is very familiar to many people in developing countries who have been subject to IMF policies. And again, it creates a group of people who are suffering a great deal of you know, disadvantage. Oh, of course. And perhaps as a way to finish our conversation, so uh, you, you have uh, published uh, a few years ago this, uh, this, uh, this key book, I think, entitled uh, Imperialism, Sovereignty and the Making of International Law. What are the things on which you are working now and uh, are you uh, preparing a, a, a new book? Uh, <laughs> um, I'm superstitious. I almost feel that I shouldn't say I'm preparing a new book. Yeah. So, so what are the <laughs> issues on which you are working? <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, two main, or well, three main issues. So one issue is the issue I mentioned to you, which is the question of what should the third world project be now? Yeah. Because the, the whole character of the third world has changed with the emergence of these new states. And project in intellectual terms, in political terms, uh, in what kind of terms? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I see myself principally as a, a scholar. As a scholar, yes. Uh, 
And I hope, uh, you know, these ideas of interest uh, to decision makers and politicians mm -hmm. and so forth. But I don't see myself as a politician. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much too, it's, it's far beyond my limited talents. So, so putting <laughs> together a, a legal road, road map which would uh, somehow make them behave perhaps better than... Uh, who knows whether they'll behave better, but at least present those ideas. Yes. And perhaps that's the best we can do as intellectuals. Uh, so that's one thing. Although that's a kind of a somewhat pretentious thing. No, 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 but I mean... Uh, myself to apply. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, another issue that interests me a great deal, and it's something that I worked on uh, in my undergraduate days, is the whole question of migrant workers. Mm -hmm. Because if I talk about disadvantaged people, you know, we have tens of millions of people who are in a very vulnerable position because they... Uh, rely on going to other countries, sometimes illegally, uh, to make whatever money they can to look after their families back yeah, home. Back home yeah. uh, so this creates all sorts of complications for even for human rights, uh, for human rights people and for international law. So I want to look at the issue broadly of the question of the historical approach to the rights of aliens. Mm -hmm. How has the law developed? And when we understand the way in which the law has developed, then can we see certain obstacles to the further development of that law? It's very interesting, for example, that migrant workers and corporations both derive their rights from a body of law that was originally titled the rights of aliens. Mm -hmm. But corporations have gone in one direction and individuals have gone in another direction. So I'm very interested in how that happens. So <laughs> corporations have, have gone in, in which direction? In a situation where their rights have been protected uh, to a very um, significant extent. Where by the state, by international law? By states, uh, which have then negotiated international treaties. To the advantage. To the advantage of these... Uh, While uh, migrants have... Uh, as immigrants uh, have found their position uh, becoming undermined in various ways. And my uh, colleague, Professor Chimney, has written about refugees, for example, about developments in refugee partly because, law. Partly because they probably come from, from, from uh, disempowered countries. Yes, and these disempowered countries quite often rely on sending these migrant workers overseas. Yeah. And they don't want... They don't want them to rock the boat. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and two things. So one is they don't want to cause any problems to the state which receives these countries. And the other uh, problem is that they do lack power. Yes. So that's the second project. Uh, the other project is... Um, my book left out three centuries of international law. I skipped from the 16th century to the 19th century. And I'm interested in working out what happens in between. So from the 16th to the 19th? To the 16th to the 19th century. And why is it an important period? Uh, because this was the period in which Grotius and Battelle, who are arguably the most significant Western international lawyers to ever write, mm -hmm. this was the period in which they were writing. And it was for that reason that I left them out, because I felt in this book I could not cover all this as well as such significant figures. And, 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 and all of this uh, will have uh, as a bearing on, on the present of international law, what it means for global justice, international justice, and I guess for the future of international law and what it means for justice at the global and international levels. I hope so, because um, I didn't intend to be a historian. I mean, I wanted to be an international lawyer, you know, practicing in a fairly conventional way and teaching it in a fairly conventional way. But I found that I couldn't understand the discipline without going into that history.